Marshall Marcus, Stephen Hartland are here with me. Marshall, we're about to have Shostakovich's 10th Symphony. I understand you played this in the National Youth Orchestra aged 11. Uh, that, Give us that perspective. Uh, that's true. I must say it was one of the most staggering experiences to come across a massive symphony like this. It, it set me going in my teens on a kind of Shostakovich obsession, which I don't think is ever finished, really. It's a great opportunity at that age to do it. What is it about the music, Steve? We, would, we sort of touched on this before, about this piece that makes it so brilliant for a youth orchestra. What have they get to, got to get their teeth into? Well, it's a mixture of things. There is slow music. It's, it's conventional, traditional music, so it means that they uh, have something to aim for as a youth orchestra to, to play it extremely well. Uh, you've got the, the, the scherzo, which is, is, academics tell us is the portrait of Stalin. Um, that's only four minutes long, and it's pretty spectacular. And of course, the final movement uh, is a huge whirlwind as well, especially at the end. I don't know, I mean, the horns, everybody seems to have something very good to play in this piece, don't they? Yeah, and I think there's just, there's an immediacy about the emotion mm. of it. And it's interesting, I mean, you were talking about the Stalin, you know, so-called connection, but in the end, we were both agreeing, it's about the sound and the way he's written it, rather than any explanation of the biography of it. Yes. I mean, one of the perennial problems with talking about Shostakovich's music is the discussion at the political level, how yeah. repressed was he by the Stalinist regime, how ironic was he able to be, how did it influence his music? And then there's the other camp that says, can we just put all that to one side and have yes. a look at the notes, please? Yeah. And well, that's only sort of rearing its head more confidently quite recently, well, I think. Well, we're certainly members of that party here. No, I mean, I just think you can give an explanation, and it's fascinating. You know, I could read it for, for years, all this stuff, but in the end, it's just, it, it gets your body when you're listening. And I think that that type of visceral effect of the symphony, again, which is what makes it a youth orchestra piece, I would say. Well, the, the other thing that they don't talk about now uh, is really when they're talking about Shostakovich is that he was a communist and an atheist. But of course, that's far too uncomfortable. So they talk about how he was repressed, and, or oppressed rather, and uh, had messages in the music for the audience and for the world at large, which I think is ridiculous, actually. I mean, he was a product of that society, and he just happened to be a brilliant composer. And in this piece, there is a message, but it's only about recently known that, in fact, it was his infatuation with a much younger woman, a student, yeah. where his own name in notes, four notes, is used, and the, her, her name, name is yes. on there in, in the, the third yes. movement. And another one of the difficulties of talking about this, you've said the Stalin movement, that's this four minute blast, as you've said, of yeah. kind of real fury and rage and temper. Shostakovich has these famously unreliable memoirs oh, yeah. written yes. by Solomon Volkov after his death. Yes. Nobody has any idea really what the composer was thinking and what he meant by this. No, music. that's right. And Solomon Volkov's writing, it's funny, it's almost if when you read it, you can't put it aside. It's there and it's done. And of course, for many years it was seen as the truth. And now everybody says, well, maybe not. You know, it's a lot of problems. But what Shostakovich did actually say about this symphony was that this short scherzo, supposedly the Stalin movement, was probably too short. He thought it was in balance. And uh, he brings it back at the very end of the final movement, of course. Mm. And as a composer, that was his genius. He realised he could reintroduce it yes. at the end of the symphony. And of course, it comes back spectacularly from a musical point of view. Mm. And it's nothing to do with the fact that a warning of Stalin coming again. Yes, but I mean, for whatever reason, the other thing that's interesting is what was it, eight years since he'd written his ninth yes, symphony? Yes, eight or nine, yes. a very long he gap for him. 15 symphonies, suddenly there is a huge gap. And that's something which, it's not a matter of explanation, it's a fact, and it's actually a very powerful thing. Mm. End of the Second World War, and it's, it's almost to the mid-50s before he comes out with this next piece. Mm. And in some ways you could say that's the reason for this explosive force, yes. that this guy hadn't written a symphony for whatever yes. reason for several years, where he'd well, been turning them out. Well, of course, there was this Darnoff was it 1948 when he was denounced yes. in the famous Donald proclamation um, and I think that then he just had to toe the line and uh, sort of wrote film music. Yes and of course that also happened to him in the 30s again when he was yeah. in the middle and the fourth symphony which doesn't get yeah. performed for years later yeah. so I mean it's a it was a stormy life there's no doubt. Oh it. without doubt it was very yeah. difficult yeah. Uh, but I, I think that basically he was a he was just a simple composer who just wrote Music. So this is the composer who wants to be left alone to write music, would you say? <laughs> In a sense, well, unfortunately, because of the, the politics, I think people yeah. have written so much into him. Yes. And, and academics yeah. at universities here and around the world just yeah. perpetuate yeah. what is often a load of rubbish. <laughs> Thanks very much to both of you.